It's very satisfying to help people. I just can't imagine a better job. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining. I'm Michael Ettinger from Ettinger Law Firm. And this is the first in our series of six Zoom side events. Um, this series started during the pandemic about a year ago when uh, the governor shut us down on March 18th and we were closed for three months. And in order just to keep people informed and current, we started the Zoom side chats and they seem to be going well. So we repeat them about once in a quarter. Uh, today's Zoom side chat is um, the five steps to an elder law estate plan. I'm going to put that up in a moment. And we're going to do one a week for the next six weeks. Next week is protect your home and life savings with the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. Week after that, components of an elder law estate plan. I'm going to follow that on May 4th with Medicaid Asset Protection Strategies. Uh, on May 11th, selected estate planning topics. We're going to talk about second marriage planning, planning for those without children, planning for those we have adult dependent and special needs children. And then we're going to finish up on the 18th with the 10 reasons why you want to have an elder law. Plan. Uh, so let me put up the slides. You did get a copy of these slides with your confirmation. So you have them. Uh, you can look at them later. You will also get a copy of this presentation uh, later on this afternoon. It'll come to you by email, a, a recording, which you can share with your friends and family or watch again. And also, um, you may not be aware of this, I'm the author of the uh, book, Elder Law Estate Planning. It's been a bestseller in the field for uh, more than 10 years. And uh, I wrote it in layman's terms. It's uh, plain English, easy to understand. Um, but, but I realized, and it's available on Amazon, or if you come into our office for an appointment, we give you a copy, we can email you a copy. But um, I realize not everybody has the time or the desire to write a book. so. As a thank you for joining me today, not only will you get this recording, but we're also going to send you a copy of my e-booklet. It comes by email. It's called Elder Law Estate Planning in a Nutshell. And what I did was I wrote a four-color booklet available by email. It's all the highlights of the book in, a, in the kind of cliff notes, you know, abbreviated version, and you'll get just about everything you need in there. So uh, look forward to that. You can share that with your friends and family. Uh, here I am in the middle. This is our uh, staff, current staff. To my left facing is my lovely wife and law partner, Suzanne Ettinger, and their other lawyers and staff. Ettinger Law Firm is limited to elder law estate planning. We've been uh, in business since 1991, so uh, more than 30 years. And all we do is uh, trust and estates, wills and probate, estate tax saving strategies, Medicaid applications, you know, Medicaid asset protection trust. We have offices in Nassau and Suffolk County, five offices on Long Island, one in Brooklyn, one in Staten Island, Westchester, we're in White Plains, 140 Grand Street, Rockland. We just moved from Nyack to New City. We're on uh, North Main Street in New City. We're in Middletown in Orange County. We're in uh, Rhinebeck and Fishco in Dutchess County. We're in Albany on Wolf Road and Saratoga Springs on Broadway. So, uh, without further ado, let's go into the five steps uh, to an elder law estate plan. Maybe I can just introduce before what is elder law uh, estate planning? Well, it's uh, the combination of uh, disability planning, which is elder law. We're going to talk about that. And estate planning, which is actually a nice way of saying death planning. And we like to say, you know, everybody needs an estate plan because the mortality rate, unfortunately, is stuck at 100%. So uh, without further ado, let's get going. We lead off with the major issues facing seniors today. And those are, we want to avoid probate court proceedings on death, which can be time consuming and expensive and delay access to the assets, uh, a whole host of issues, most of which is you lose control of the estate. So we wanna avoid court proceedings on death. We wanna avoid uh, what's the multiple court proceeding? If you own a place here and a place in Florida, for example, we'd have to have two probates. We want to avoid probates for out of state property. We want to certainly avoid having a legal guardian appointed for us in the event of disability instead of somebody we know and love and trust. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We want to avoid all New York and federal estate taxes. Uh, I'll mention uh, uh, President Biden's proposed estate. Uh, changes in the estate tax a little later on. 
We want to protect our assets from the extraordinarily high cost of long-term care, either at home or in a nursing facility. And we want to keep the inheritance we leave in the bloodline. Uh, so if uh, after our sons and daughters, it goes to our grandchildren, protect it if they get divorced or sued, but make sure it doesn't end up with in-laws and their families, which happens all too often for lack of planning. This is just an overview, and then we're going to get into the weeds a little bit. So the first of the five steps to an estate plan is understanding the family dynamics. Now, what we believe at Ettinger Law Firm is that estate planning, in a sense, it's 90% social, 10% legal. Um, we find not enough lawyers do the social work before doing the legal work, but it's a social exercise. And in fact, you know, the older you get, the more you realize most of, of life is social work, social dynamics. So what I'm getting at here is first, we want to get to know you and your family. Uh, obviously, do you have children? What's your relationship with them? Uh, who gets along with who in your family and who doesn't and why? Why do we wanna know? Because we're gonna have a more effective estate plan if we understand the family dynamics. Uh, are they married? If they're married, how do you feel about their spouses? Uh, you like them, you don't like them, why don't you like them? Are they controlling? It's very important to know if your son or daughter is being controlled by somebody else because that will affect how we leave the inheritance. If they're not careful and they're controlled, the person controlling them may get access to the money or make them part with it. So we have to be careful about that. Um, now, we also want to know if you have children, do they have children, either they or their spouse from this marriage, the current marriage or from previous marriage? Then we're going to have to take steps to make sure that their children from previous marriage get treated fairly because after all this, they are your grandchildren. Uh, that requires some thought and planning and structure. Uh, what kind of work do they do? Uh, why do we wanna know that? Well, if they're in the healthcare field, they might be good for a, um, a healthcare agent. If they're in financial or business, they might be better to handle your legal and financial affairs. Um, so that's important information. Uh, where do they live? Um, maybe. Uh, you know, somebody might be in the healthcare field, but they live in Seattle. Maybe they're not the right person to pick to make a medical decision. Uh, on the, although these days with so much uh, happening by Zoom and telemedicine, uh, that may be changing. We may be able to pick somebody uh, in, in Seattle who's the best choice because they can get on the Zoom with the doctor and it's just like being or close to being in person. So uh, even that is changing today. Um, essentially, we want to make sure that the plan will work socially. And this is going to make a uh, big difference in whether your family gets along after you're gone or they end up fighting with each other and, and heaven forbid, never talking to each other again. Um, you can anticipate the problems and kind of cut them off at the past. There are almost unlimited number of options to avoid problems. What you need to uh, have the lawyer do is flesh out the problems and then provide you with solutions. What do other people do and why? What are my options? I train the lawyers here at Ettinger Law Firm. And one of the things I train them in is that the job of the estate planning lawyer is to give the client ideas, ideas of what to do so the client can make a choice. If you don't have the ideas, you don't have the options, you can't make the choice. So our job is to give you the options and this is gonna help us flesh it out and see what your best options are. Let's move on to step two. Want to review your existing estate planning documents. So you're gonna bring in your will, trust, power of attorney, health proxy, and living will. And we're going to first determine, are they legally sufficient? Very often they're not. The power of attorney law has changed many times. The ones before 2010 are, are obsolete. We have to redo those. Uh, soon we're gonna have a new power of attorney law. We're gonna to have to redo the even the ones after 2010. They're making it more concise. Uh, the current power of attorney requires 14 pages to get all the information the power is in, and that's a little bit unwieldy. Uh, we want to look at your will. Is it up to date? Your trust, is it legally sufficient? But also, is it personally sufficient? Does this reflect your current wishes? Is this who you want in charge for executor or trustee? Is this who you want as your agent of the power of attorney? Is this who you want to make medical decisions? Um, uh, who is best for legal, medical, and financial? Uh, and, and we also want to know 
um, currently uh, how you want your estate to be distributed all at once or spread out over time. Um, different amounts, different people are equal amounts. Lots to talk about there, but bring in the documents. We'll see if any of them are usable uh, or, or if they need a repair or improvement. One of the things I'd like to mention on your healthcare proxy, I'm going to make sure that the client picks somebody who's up to the task, who can say um, when enough is enough and terminate life support. I had a case a couple of years ago that taught me a good lesson. I had a client come in and he told me that his mother was on life support on a ventilator for two years, that she could not get out of bed, that she could not open her eyes, that she couldn't, she couldn't communicate. Um, and um, she was on a feeding tube. Well, uh, and this was for two years. I was, I was in shock. Um, uh, I said, well, what happens when you go in and see her? She says, well, when I put my hand in her, she can squeeze my, my finger. Uh, you know, I, I asked him, did, he, did, did she have a living will? He said, yes. Um, I was very disturbed by this, as you know, you might imagine. And uh, it took me uh, about 24 hours to process it. And what I learned from it was, I think his mother may have chosen the wrong person. She did sign the living will saying she didn't want to be kept alive by life support, but I don't think he had the ability to say when enough is enough. Uh, so I counseled him in that regard. But again, uh, my advice, health proxy, pick somebody who's level-headed, who's clinical, who can deal with the situation and not be emotional and not be able to do what needs to be done, which is to carry out your wishes. It's not their wishes. It's your wishes. Are you a U.S. citizen? This will impact on uh, estate tax planning, if you have a larger estate. Um, do you expect to receive an inheritance? That may affect um, your planning, uh, and we'll have to talk about that. Should the inheritance be left to your trust, for example, if you set up a trust? If you're trying to protect assets, you want to make sure that inheritance that comes later on uh, may be protected right at the time you get it. Do you have long-term care insurance? And if you do, what's the daily benefit? Uh, and the duration, is it for three years, five years, lifetime? Do you have an inflation rider? And there are different ones. Uh, there's a, a simple inflation rider, 3% or 5% a year. There's a compound inflation rider, can be 3% uh, or 5%. And we're going to use all of this to help us determine uh, what the plan is going to be. We also have to look at your assets, uh, your real estate. Um, do you have LLCs? Do you have corporations? Uh, do you have money in banks, IRAs, retirement plans, uh, non-IRAs, cash, securities, investments? Uh, all this goes into preparing the plan properly because IRA money is handled different from non-IRA money. Um, uh, so there's a lot to um, develop here uh, in terms of what are your assets and how should they be treated? Um, how are they titled? Is it joint? Do they have beneficiaries? What are the value? Um, this also impinges on the estate planning. Are they qualified or not qualified? IRA, 401k, everything that's not IRA, 401k, 403b is non-qualified. Do they have beneficiaries designated? Now, you may have plans with beneficiaries. You may know that IRAs and 401ks do not go into a trust for a couple of reasons. They do not go through probate. They have a designated beneficiary. And IRAs, the principal the, of the IRA and the 401k are exempt from Medicaid. I don't need to move the, those to protect them from Medicaid. Medicaid can only get your required minimum distribution. They can't get any more, so I don't have to protect the IRAs. Um, but I want to make sure if they're outside the trust, do they have beneficiaries designated? Now, if it's a non-IRA and you put it into a trust and only non-IRA money goes into a trust, the beneficiaries come off. Any beneficiaries you have on that non-IRA non account come off because the trust now has the beneficiaries. So there's no beneficiaries on a trust account. The beneficiaries are named in the trust. And here, oh, let me go back a bit, uh, previous. Uh, we want to also uh, consider if it's a second marriage um, where it's going to be plenty to talk about. Uh, does anything go to your kids on your death uh, or does everything go after your spouse dies? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, what's going to happen with the house? Um, what rights will the spouse have? Lots of talk about second marriage planning. It's going to be uh, coming up, actually, uh, in a few weeks. Maybe that's, uh, let me go back to my notes. 
uh, second marriage planning is going to be on May 11th. Uh, if you're on a second marriage, make sure to take in that May 11th uh, a Zoom side chat. Um, now we're on step four, developing the elder law estate plan. So as you can see, we've looked at your documents. We looked at your financials. We did the social work. You can start to see how this can coalesce into a plan. Um, and now we're going to interview you. Who do you want to make medical decisions for you? Generally, if you have a spouse, your spouse is first and you pick somebody second. You can only pick one person at a time. Uh, the reason for that is that if you pick two people and they don't agree, the doctor wouldn't know what to do. So by law, you pick one person at a time, you know, your spouse first, maybe your son second, maybe you have two or three children. Uh, he will discuss it hopefully with his brothers and sisters, but only the, the doctor will only take instructions from one person. So who's your first and second choice? You can even put in a third choice if you like, but only one person serves at a time. Who do you want to handle your legal and financial affairs? Generally, we're going to pick the same person for your power of attorney who handles your legal and financial affairs if you become disabled, and that's going to be the same person who's going to handle your legal and financial affairs after you pass, the executor under a will or the trustee under the trust. Next question, do you need a trust or a will? Well, this is a big question. Um, generally, we do wills for people maybe up to 60 uh, or so. Uh, the reason being uh, a trust is superior as you get older because a trust has a plan for disability. A will does not. So, and, and a trust is more expensive than a will. So we generally use a will for the time when you're not likely to need it. So it's more like a just in case plan, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, you have a will. As you get older, you need a plan for disability because eventually about half of all people have a period of disability where they can't handle their affairs. So now we're looking at a trust. Because a trust takes effect while you're living, which is why they call them living trust, you can put in your own plan for disability. You say, I'm in charge now, but if I become disabled, I name so-and-so to step in. Uh, usually one or more of the adult children. Fortunately for all of us listening today, a trust uh, prevents a guardianship proceeding. It's more powerful than guardianship and it prevents a state appointed a legal guardian who can be a stranger, uh, something obviously we don't want. Uh, so now if we're uh, 60 plus, we're generally looking at a trust. Should it be revocable or irrevocable? Well, these two trusts uh, have a lot in common. They're mostly the same. They both avoid probate at death. They both avoid guardianship proceedings if you become disabled. They can both keep your assets in the bloodline and protect the inheritance you leave from divorces, lawsuits, and creditors. But revocable trusts offer no nursing home protection at all because you could take it out at any time. Uh, you're in charge. So if you, if you have to go into nursing home, they'll say, well, you can get it, take it out and give it to us. If you could get it, they could get it. Starting at 70, give or take a few years, people will set up the irrevocable trust. This one uh, creates a couple of roadblocks that Medicaid or nursing homes can't break through. The first roadblock is you have to name somebody else as the trustee, usually one or more of the adult children. Medicaid has no control over them. Uh, what does that mean they're the trustee? Well, it means they're the manager. You still own the trust and you still have the exclusive use and enjoyment of those trust assets, but they're the manager. They act like a figurehead for you. Uh, the second roadblock, um, the irrevocable trust sets up that prevents Medicaid from getting your assets is you must limit yourself to the income only. And in fact, we call them income only trusts and it means what it says. You put in stocks, you only get the dividends. You put in CDs, you only get the interest. You put in your house, because it doesn't earn, in, doesn't earn income, you get the equivalent. Exclusive right to live there, use and enjoy that property during your lifetime. What happens to these assets? They stay in the trust and they go to your heirs free of the expense and delay of a probate. So generally, uh, people as they get older have a lot of assets they're not gonna spend like their home. Uh, for heaven's sakes, move to protect your home. Uh, if you need care and you have a home, they can put a lien on it and eventually the lien gets bigger than the house and the county walks away with the, with the house. It happens every day. So protect your home. And also a lot of clients have assets they're not spending. Client could come in and say, uh, they have a nest egg, maybe four or 500,000. It's not IRA, because remember IRA is protected. 
but they might have four or 500,000. They'll tell me, well, we're not spending that money because we were living on our income. It's extra money just in case. Uh, some people say, well, we're not spending the money, but we're taking the interest or dividends. Fine, I say, the trust gives you the interest or dividends. But if you have a nest egg that you don't need to live on, you're actually safe keeping it for the nursing home industry. Why not put it into that Medicaid trust? Still there if you need it, but somebody else can't come and take it away from you. I'll be talking about more about this uh, on um, my weekly elder law estate planning seminar tomorrow, which I'll tell you about later, how you can join, how you can join up for that. How do you want the estate distributed? I mentioned this earlier, but there's an unlimited number of combinations. You uh, Generally, uh, people leave it to their children, but um, they'll often want to leave it to a trust for their children. You know, your son could be in charge of the trust, but it's protected if he gets divorced or sued. And if he dies, it goes to your grandson instead of his wife and her family, that sort of thing. Um, you could distribute it all at once or over time. You could say, give them 20% when I die, half after five years, the rest after 10 years. Um, depends on your family. And then you don't necessarily have to treat everybody equal. We have a an expression in estate planning, we say, there's nothing so unequal as the equal treatment of unequals. Uh, that bears repeating. There's nothing so unequal as the equal treatment of unequals. You know, we have a client come in, the son might be a hedge fund manager on Wall Street making millions a year, and uh, the other uh, son or daughter is a massage therapist. Um, and then the client wants to know if they should leave the estate 50 50. Well, uh, what we suggest in a case like that, for example, is why not do something called a soft probe? Meet with the hedge fund guy and say, uh, look, you know, we're planning our estate. You know, we're thinking leaving your brother a little more because, you know, obviously needs it more. You know, what do you think? Like a soft probe. And you'll get a reaction. The person will say, of course, leave everything to my brother. I don't need it, you know, by all means. And then, you know, your conscience is clear. Or they might as some kids say, well, I don't think that's fair. I think it should be 50-50. You know, sometimes the well-off uh, feel that way. So um, you'll do whatever you decide once you uh, get that feedback. Uh, so lots to talk about there. Uh, if you have issues, uh, likely we have uh, seen them before. We have prepared over 30,000 estate plans in the last uh, 31 or so years. So um, not likely, it's not something we have come across, but we have a lot of solutions. Again, we're gonna give you the options. What are other people doing? Why? and then you make your decision. As I said, should it pay out immediately over time? Uh, over time, there's a number of options. Let's say a uh, uh, son dies, heaven forbid, and it goes to grandson. Our trust will hold it in trust until he's 35 and use the money, the trustee, usually uh, his one of his father's brothers, sisters, and uncle or aunt, the trustees are also bloodline, will use the money for his health, education, maintenance, and support. Whatever they don't use, they turn over at age 35 or another age that you uh, choose. Um, let's talk about uh, estate taxes. Uh, I don't wanna scare anybody off. Most of our clients have much less than 6 million, um, but some of, uh, some of the clients have 6 million. And uh, we're looking at an estate tax, just New York alone, of over 500,000 and 6 million or so estate. Um, you can avoid the tax if you have a spouse. You set up a trust, one for this uh, husband, one for the wife. And you wouldn't pay tax unless you get over 12 million. How much do you save? You start at 500,000, you save over a million in New York estate taxes. A good time to talk about um, uh, President Biden's proposal to lower the, the federal exemption. I didn't even have a slide on because under the Trump rules, uh, it was 11,700,000. Uh, and a couple could double that to almost 24 million. Um, uh, President Biden's uh, estate tax plan. Uh, is proposing to lower the exemption to 3.5 million, which is what we had back in the Clinton era, 3.5 million. Uh, if you have a spouse and you set up two trusts and you have to do this before the first spouse dies, you'll be able to exempt 7 million. That'll protect most people. But if you're, uh, if you're a larger state, you may wanna come in and talk about state tax planning now. You may wanna move assets before they change the law. Just a word to the wise for people who have larger estates. Um, so step five, executing and maintaining the plan. So 
we, uh, you know, have had the interview, uh, we've drafted the plan. Now we're going to meet with you. We're going to review and explain the documents, answer any questions you have. Um, you can get the documents ahead of time to review. Our preference is wait for the meeting with the lawyer so we can go over the documents, but we're flexible uh, is your choice. Uh, we will give you instructions on changing the beneficiaries on the IRA 401k. Uh, why would we change the beneficiaries? Well, it would still generally be the spouse first, but we may want to have those children's inheritance protection trust second. Those inheritance protection trusts protect the inheritance you leave from children's divorces, lawsuits, and creditors then passed by blood instead of by marriage. Who doesn't want that? We're going to talk about that more in my general seminar tomorrow, uh, which you'll see is on uh, ettingerplan.com. Uh, we publish a law letter once a week. It's called the Ettinger Elder E-Lert because it comes by email. Won an award for that. Uh, and we publish one article a week letting you know if there's a law change that affects you. Uh, an Ettinger plan uh, is reviewed every three years. We send you a letter. There's no charge. We want you to come in to see if there's any changes in your health, your assets, your family, births, deaths, marriage, divorces. After all, we want it to work when you need it. Hopefully, many decades from now, instead of when you wrote it. Um, so I was mentioning my seminar. Um, every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, uh, I give a seminar. It's uh, four reasons why trust protected better than wills. Actually, sometimes we call it uh, the four advantages of trust. It's the same seminar, just has a couple of uh, names. But tomorrow will be the four advantages of trust. The content is the same. Um, you go to ettingerplan.com, and that's where you register. Um, even if you can't make it tomorrow at two o'clock, uh, you register anyway and you get the recording. You go watch it at your leisure. Uh, so that's the full blown. Uh, it's all of elder law estate planning, everything you need to know. I'll talk about revocable and irrevocable trust. I'll go into the inheritance protection trust. Uh, if you get a chance to see that seminar, you'll know everything you need to know about elder law estate planning. You'll be in a position um, to have a, a meeting with us, either Zoom or online and see how all this applies to your personal situation. Um, Ettinger Law Firm has a unique planning process. Um, it's already begun with this talk. Uh, we offer a free initial consultation, very low key. Uh, as I said, you've been through it. You know, we're gonna interview you about your sons and daughters. What kind of work do they do? Where do they live? You know, who gets along with who? That sort of thing. We're gonna review those documents brought in, the will, trust, power of attorney, see if they're adequate. We'll give you a copy of my book, Elder Law Estate Plan, and we'll tell you which chapters apply to your situation. Might be an hour or so worth of reading, not too much. We'll tell you if you decide if you need something, and um, uh, we're recommending something. Although you're not deciding now, it's still early at that first meeting. We'll let you know if you decide to go forward later on. This is how much it will cost according to our fee schedule. It has nothing to do with what your assets are. Um, we. Uh, like at Ettinger Law Firm to set up a second pre-follow-up consultation to have your questions answered. So the way that works is you, you come in for the second meeting. We answer any questions you have about the chapters we ask you to read in the book uh, and also anything uh, that arose out of the first meeting. Uh, we draft that estate plan together with you. You know about that from earlier. You know, we ask you those questions. Who do you want for legal, medical, financial? How do you want it distributed, et cetera? At the end of that second meeting, we'll give you a detailed three-page written proposal for the fees quoted. You know, we mentioned it last time, now it's in writing, and then we say, what would you like to do? Uh, fortunately, over the years, a number of people have said, yes, let's go ahead. And now we break with tradition. At Ettinger Law Firm, we do not have a retainer agreement. Uh, I believe we're the only firm in the country that doesn't have one. Um, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, I was trained like every other estate planning lawyer. If a client wants to go ahead, you have them sign your agreement uh, and give you a check for uh, half the fee to get you started. Uh, the fee is actually, the check is called the retainer. You've been retained. Um, the reason we don't do that at Ettinger Law Firm is because we analyzed it a number of years ago and we concluded the reason lawyers are uh, trained to get a retainer agreement in the check is because it's good for the lawyer. But we asked, is it good for the client? And we decided it wasn't because the client loses control. You've paid half the fee. You don't have anything. Are you going to get what you like? Is it going to be to your satisfaction? Is it going to be timely? Uh, sometimes it isn't. So uh, we prefer to keep the client in control. 
we don't take any fees until all the work is done because what we realize, and I, I believe this is a breakthrough in legal thinking, if the client is in control, obviously it's the best place for the client to be. And if we're here to serve the client and that's the best place for the client to be, it must be the best, best place for us to be. It's actually worked very well. So we have a fee proposal. We sign it, you don't sign it. The proposal says, based on your say so, we're going to go ahead, prepare all these documents, trust, inheritance trust, health proxy, living will, power of attorney. After everything's signed and done, you're satisfied, you pay at the end. Um, so you come into that final meeting, review all the documents, and you decide uh, if everything's your satisfaction, you sign it, you pay at the end, you can pay by check or credit card, you can pay it at once, you can pay it in three monthly installments. Um, but after that, we don't say goodbye. The standard in New York and, and around the country is thank you very much, goodbye. I mean, uh, I don't think anybody listening ever heard, again, from the lawyer prepared their will. And we find that uh, doesn't work very well in practice. So we don't say goodbye, we say welcome. You're now uh, uh, a client of the firm. And we trademarked a process. It was designed, it's called the Ettinger Elder Law Estate Planning Process, trademarked it in uh, 99, about 22 years ago. And we designed it to make sure if it's an Ettinger plan, it'll work when you need it. Not when you wrote it, I hope decades earlier. So we keep you up to date of law changes and other matters with our weekly Ettinger Elder Alert. We call it that because it comes by email. But the key is this, every three years, Ettinger Law Firm sends you a letter, time to come in for your free review. Uh, we want to see any changes in your health, your assets, your family, births, deaths, marriage, divorces. So, you know, people come after three years, you know, not too many people need a change, but we're building a relationship. We, we, we renew the acquaintance, it's valuable. After six years, naturally, more people need a change. But the reason we do it is statistically it's been shown that very few people can get past nine or 12 years without needing a major change. Who's in charge? Who they're leaving to? Something else happened. So you do an amendment. Amendments, they say, average once every 10 years. That's legal work. You're going to pay for that. But we're still talking hundreds, not thousands. And you're good to go. The point is, when you go to use an Ettinger plan, it's designed to work when you need it. Not when you wrote it, I hope decades earlier. We have saved thousands of people, many thousands of problems with that system. It's free and it has a side effect, when some, a good side effect. When something happens to one of our clients, we know who it is because we've seen them uh, within the last uh, three years. Um, if you have a question, type it and, and I'll take it at the end. Type it in your Q&A at the bottom. I'll take it at the end. At Ettinger Law Firm, we don't charge for phone calls, emails, or questions. What this means is after you've paid us that fee, um, we're on retainer without charge. You can call us anytime. You have a question, or you can email us. We answer all questions. We don't charge for it. And we don't do that because we want people to communicate with us. And you know, this, I believe, is quite valuable. You have an elder law firm on retainer for no charge. You can call anytime and get the right answer. And I don't have to tell you, getting the right answer these days is very hard. Uh, people come into my office full of confusion. Their accountant said, their financial advisor said, their neighbors said, well, um, it's not a poll where you, you know, you canvass opinions. You actually have to get the answer from somebody who knows what they're doing um, and not just somebody who has an opinion who's well-meaning but can't really help you. So I think it's quite valuable to have an experienced elder law estate planning firm on retainer on your site. As I say, by using this program, your plan is never more than three years old, designed to work when you need it, not when you signed it, I hope, many decades earlier. Um, I invite you uh, to a free consultation. Uh, I say it's a $500 value because a lot of firms charge for this. In fact, a lot of firms with less experience than ours charge for this, but want to keep you in control. So it's free, but it's still worth $500. It'll be with myself or my wife-in-law partner, Suzanne, or one of our experienced elder law state planning attorneys. We don't have any inexperience. All our attorneys are experienced. When we hire a new attorney, we only hire experienced ones, and then we trade them in our, train them in our systems and processes. Um, you can have your free consultation in one of our offices, 14 offices around the state. I myself live on Long Island, uh, but once a week I go to White Plains uh, and uh, New City. Um, it can be by video, Zoom, like this. It can be by phone. With the uh, uh, copy of the seminar, you're also going to get um, an invitation to schedule your own appointment on our link. It's called Calendly. 
uh, it's not going to be emailed to you tomorrow. We sped it up and um, it's going to be today. Uh, later on this afternoon, you'll get the recording. And the link, you just go in and you open up, open it up, and uh, you pick the time that you want to see us. It's free and it's very low key. You know, we you don't pay anything till the end. We go slow. We build your confidence so that by, by the time you're uh, ready to sign your plan, you know exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it. I have an expression. I like to say, if you don't understand the plan, you don't have a plan. We've had a lot of people come in who didn't understand what they had. And so well, we're not going to repeat that experience. You're going to understand what you have. You're going to understand exactly what happens in the event of death or disability. And you're going to have a plan to cover every contingency. If you prefer to schedule your appointment uh, in person uh, with a person on the phone, you can call Patty Brown. She's our director of client relations, been with the firm for more than 26 years. She's at this 800 number, and she can also answer any questions you have. You can email Patty, pbrown at trustlaw.com, or text free C for consultation to the number on your screen. Okay, so now I'm going to stop the share, and I'm going to go ahead and answer the, the questions you have. We have a number of questions. Um, so I'm going to answer the live ones, and then I'm going to go to the ones that were sent in ahead of time. Dave M. says, with a new POA form available in a few months, should update my 2016 power of attorney, uh, which is as a statutory gifts writer. Yeah. Dave, we don't have the new form yet. It's been approved by the legislature, so uh, it's law, but it hasn't been published. So when you get the new form, um, it's not going to make the old form obsolete immediately, but it will make it um, obsolete soon. So you could probably ride your 2016 power of attorney. You could probably ride it uh, another few years, maybe to uh, three or four years. And then when it gets 10 years old, I would say replace it with a new form. Uh, Alonzo W. says, since the 401k and IRA are not in the trust, how do you set up a, distrib a distribution plan for them over time versus lump sum payment for beneficiaries? Uh, that's not difficult, Alonzo, because you can leave the 401k or, or IRA to a trust, and the trust in the trust you can put in the distribution you want. So we can do that. Uh, Susan E says, is your 403b part of the total exemption amount, even though it's pre-tax? Yes, um, I know this doesn't sound fair, but it's the gross amount of your 403b that's part of your estate um, for state tax purposes. You have a one... You have uh, 800,000 in your IRA, you have 800,000 for state tax purposes, even though it hasn't been taxed. It's like double taxation. Wesley K says, what if we plan on moving out of state in the next two years? Uh, well, Wes, if you're moving out of state, I'm going to want to know um, what state you're moving to. Uh, it depends on your age. Uh, you know, if your health is okay, and maybe in your 60s, I'd say, well, you know, you could afford to wait a couple of years. Do it where you're moving to. Uh, and to find an elder law attorney in another state, uh, I hope you have a pen and you can take this down. You would go to this uh, website. It's the website of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, and it's n-a-e-l-a dot org. Naela, n-a-e-l-a dot org. And you can search for an attorney, any uh, an elder law attorney anywhere in the country by zip code. Uh, let's move down. Um, Mario P says, if I were to move out of New York after the plan is prepared, does it have to be updated? And how would a 10-year review be processed? A uh, three-year review, actually. Um, the, the, the plan is portable. It'll work in any state as long as it's valid in the state you created in. Uh, other states have to recognize it. Uh, and we would do the review by Zoom or by telephone. Not a problem. Anonymous says, hi, when you put your home in a trust, do you, do you pay its bills from your personal checking account? Well, you can pay repairs, improvements. Home, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, from your personal checking account, you would pay your uh, utilities. Either you or the trust can pay for homeowners insurance, taxes, repairs, and improvements. You can pay it from trust money because the house is in the trust, or you can pay it from outside the trust. Have some options there. Lynn D says, is a Medicaid trust different from a revocable, irrevocable trust? When I say irrevocable, I mean the Medicaid trust. So the Medicaid trust and the irrevocable trust are synonymous. Eileen C says, do I need to be concerned about this if I have no real expensive property, uh, but do have some lawsuits in the process? Well, um, 
if you have some lawsuits in the process, um, you may want to come and talk to me about asset protection. Joseph M., if you're a snowbird and moved to Florida in a year or so, is the trust also good in Florida? Yes, Joe, it's good in Florida. Um, so you can set it up here and take it to Florida. Um, but depending on your age, and if it's serious that you plan to move to Florida in the next year, you might wait and do it in Florida. Again, go to that naela.org and search for an elder law attorney. If you're going to Southeast Florida, I have a good elder law attorney in the uh, Palm Beach, uh, Boynton Beach, Hollywood, Hallandale area. Um, but if it's if it's a little more vague, if it could be like two years, you might want to come in and see me and talk about it now. Jane S. said, if you already have a revocable trust, how complicated is it to change to an irrevocable trust? Well, Jane, you can't change your irrevocable to an irrevocable. You have to redo it. Um, they don't fit well together at all. It's uh, very hard to amend the revocable to an irrevocable. Anonymous, if the estate limit gets lowered to three and a half million and you already have over that, are there other ways to protect money that will probably continue to grow before death? Yes, Anonymous. Um, we have a spouse. You have to set up the two trusts to double the exemption. If you don't have a spouse, we want to talk to you now about moving assets to your children before the new law takes place. Um, and remember, whatever you move to the children, the growth is in their names, not in yours. So you you uh, solve that problem. We'll see how much you feel you need to live on, how much you can move, uh, maybe move assets to trust for them and do a gift, gift tax returns. Um, and and uh, you have to report the gift, but there's no tax. Eileen says, Eileen C., if I've been separated from uh, two of my children since their birth, how might they prove a relationship to myself? Um, well, that's a little bit of a, a complicated question. Um, they probably, if you had a trust, they really wouldn't know uh, about um, your estate or what you had. If you have a will, it's uh, much more complicated because that can be found and given notice. So, uh, Eileen, you may want to talk to me uh, uh, more about that in person, about setting up a trust to avoid a court proceeding. Um, and also just to flesh out the whole issue, whether you want them to receive a share of the estate or not. Um, Ronald S., if we sign up with your firm, do you protect us if there are legal or court issues brought up that need to be defended? Well, um, as the preparer of the legal documents, we cannot represent you because we would be a witness to the preparation and to the documents. Uh, so we act as witnesses, we'll defend the trust, We'll defend what we did, but generally it'll have to be another lawyer to represent you because we're uh, in the middle between, generally between two parties, the person uh, who's trying to pull the trust and the person who's attacking the trust, but we can't represent either of those sides. We can just uh, uh, help the side that's defending the trust. Joseph M., if you have a trust, you also need long-term care insurance. That's a big question, Joe. Uh, depends on your age, your health. Uh, I believe you said you might be moving to Florida. The rates are different there. Um, I wrote about that in my book, um, Long-Term Care Insurance versus the Trust. You may want to uh, do a hybrid. My trust will uh, help make you eligible for home care here in New York and for facility care. Uh, Florida is different. So if you go to Florida, uh, you, you may want some minimum long-term care insurance. They don't have as uh, strong benefits as we have here in New York. Linda G says, hello. Hi, Linda. Thank you for uh, the uh, friendly uh Input, anonymous. I want to discuss my trust plans with my two adult sons who for various reasons I will treat differently. Therefore, I have two living trusts with each of them as successor trustee. But I can't remember why it was necessary to have two additional trusts, one for each of them in their own name. Well, those trusts uh, are inheritance protection trusts. So the inheritance goes uh, to each of their trusts or each in charge of their own can do whatever they want with the money. They could buy, sell, trade, spend. They could spend the whole thing, but it's protective to get divorced, protective to get sued. And if they die, it goes to their children, not their spouse. Um, so um, you, you may want to uh, discuss your plans with me before discussing it with your uh, sons to get my input and make sure you don't make a social mistake. Uh, and now I'm gonna go uh, find the questions that people sent in in advance, which I have here, okay. We set it up in advance. I have uh, uh, Susan E says uh, the possible new estate tax rules. Uh, as I said, Susan, the proposal is, uh, by the way, if you have any more questions, keep typing them. I'll answer them uh, once I answer these. 
Uh, we're going to see what happens after the horse trading is done. Is it going to be three and a half million? Is it going to be five million, six million? Right now, it's 11.7 million. It's not going to stay there. We know that for sure. Hopefully, it'll go down to what New York is. Kathleen, type in your question. I'll be uh, happy to answer it. Um, you know, hopefully, it'll be the same as New York, about six million. And, and, and uh, that's something maybe we can live with. Alice H says, what are the updated press rules? Uh, I'm sorry, Alice, I'm not sure what that question means. Joanne E, I read the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. I own my home now in considerable investments. Say I place them in a trust. Two years from now, I can no longer manage my own and have to go to assisted living facility. What happens? Well, you'll have a, a trustee uh, who handles it for you. If, you're, if you start as the trustee, somebody else will be the backup. If somebody else starts as a trustee, they will just continue. How do I pay the up, upfront fees and other fees for the assisted living? Well, you can make a gift out to your son or daughter from the uh, Medicaid trust and they can pay for you. If I have to sell the house and my investments to pay the assisted living uh, facility, what is the point of putting these assets in the trust? Well, the trust protects you if you need long-term care in a nursing facility which uh, costs now up to 20,000 a month and you won't lose your assets to pay for that. Uh, but assisted living is private, but that's not 20,000 a month, that might be five or 6,000 a month. So you use your income and some of your assets to pay for assisted living, but your assets will be protected if you need care in a long-term care nursing home facility. Uh, Joanne E says another question, how involved is the annual tax form the trust has to file? It's actually a very simple form. If it's if it's a revocable trust, there's no tax return at all because the revocable trust uses your social security number. If it's an irrevocable trust, it has to file what's called an informational return. Very simple. I have instructions for your tax preparer. It's a one-page return. It tells the IRS all the income from the Medicaid trust is payable to you. You'll pick up the tax on your individual return, and it's the same as if you didn't have the trust. It passes right through. It's called a grant or a trust. Very simple. Frederick B. says, I have a friend whose mother has died. She has three surviving children and no will. She has no house but over $50,000 in the bank. What do they have to do to split up the money? Um, if she has no will, they have to go to court and file an administration proceeding to have an administrator appointed. It can be one or more of the children and uh, the court will authorize them to uh, collect the money. It's like a probate court proceeding, but it's called an administration proceeding. They'll go to the children equal shares by law. A Gene S says, can you take majority of money from an IRA to invest in buying a home? Uh, that's a financial question. Uh, I don't believe so, but uh, you'll have to check with your financial advisor. It's, that's not a, a legal question. Would you pay penalties or re reinvest in home purchase again? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. This is my mom's account and she's 85 years old. Um, maybe you want to come in and talk to me, Gene, because uh, I have a, a question as to why an 85 year old would want to buy a home uh, at this point um, in the name of their IRA, much less, unless you think it's an investment for a rental. Uh, but again, um, you might want to Google that and look at that and read the IRA rules on investing in real estate. It's not my area of expertise. Frank F says, does a, does a designation of beneficiary for an IRA account override a will? Yes, the beneficiary designation on the IRA overrides any will. If a spouse passes away, does the income from withdrawal plan stop or is automatically transferred to the surviving spouse's name or IRA account? Uh, if the spouse passes away and you left it to your spouse, it's called the spousal rollover, uh, changes the spouse's name and becomes his or her IRA, and they continue taking based on their life expectancy. Is the surviving spouse responsible for credit card debt of the spouse who passed? Uh, generally, we can avoid that. Wesley K says, how do you protect pensions, IRAs, 401ks, from Medicaid and potential lawsuits? Uh, well, they are protected by law, so we don't have to do much about that. And finally, Carl E. says, given the more realistic possibility of wealth taxes in New York State and the U.S. in general, can the formation of a trust protect family assets from unrealized capital gains tax assets? No, we cannot use the trust to protect you from, from unrealized capital gains, but there are things we can do to reduce or eliminate estate taxes. Uh, let's see if there's any more questions typed in while. Um, so I think we're all set. Um, I really thank you for uh, joining me and I hope uh, we'll see you tomorrow at the uh, registered ettingerplan.com 
and we'll talk about the four major reasons why we prefer trust over wills. Thank you for coming and hope to see you on the Zoom side chat next Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Have a good day.